Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today to uh, the next in the series of uh, basically what can you do talks. I'm really excited today. Uh, Mary Louisa Nosh is, uh, is presenting. She is a professor at Saxo, which uh, many of you won't know what that is. It's in humanities faculty. It's the department that I believe covers archaeology, ethnology, history, Latin and Greek. And so she's a uh, technically not one of us from science soon, but um, I've actually known her a remarkably long time. She, uh, when, when I first moved here in about 2005, very shortly after, this trio of very glamorous ladies came to visit Esker over in the Niels Bohr Institute. And I was like, these are researchers wearing all these fancy clothes and looking so smart. And it was Mary Louise's team coming over from uh, what was to become the Center for Textile Research, a Grundforsting Center that she was soon to lead. And actually we got talking and, uh, and actually I was very, very impressed because although they were not from science, they were very interested in science, which was kind of new to me back in those days. So it was really exciting to, to start some collaborations with them. I mean, Mary Louisa's background is I believe in history and philosophy um, and she was trained in France in KU. Her PhD is from Salzburg and uh, she came back to Denmark. And as I said, she was awarded a DNRF center a while back, I won't say when, but I know at the time she was one of the youngest center directors who ever got one. So was doing very, very prominent things already then. And I have to say that in many ways, I actually idolize uh, Mary Louisa. I, uh, not just for the research she does, but for the non-research things that she does. And that was why I was so excited to get her to talk today, because as I said, despite being a very high profile researcher and she's been given many awards for her research and she's a member of many of the academies out there, She's also been really fundamental in driving initiatives for the betterment of people or the improvement of, of uh, researchers. So for example, she kickstarted the UCPH Forward program for the uh, young beginning faculty. Um, she uh, is actually famous at KU for her success in getting Marie Curie fellows. I mean, I know Matthew Collins is good at that, but Mary Louisa really is the expert at doing that. And most recently, she, she was elected president of the Royal Academy of Science and Letters, which is a job you don't take unless you're really, really very, very serious about doing things outside of your everyday day job. She's also on the board of the Willem Foundation, so she's very um, influential in many, many areas. And, and that's why I'm delighted she's willing to talk today about how she got to where she is, but also why she took some of these decisions to take her away from the classic textile research that she, she loves and do these other things. So with that, uh, I'll say thanks to her for coming. Please remember to put your microphones on. I'll hand over to Mary Louisa. And then uh, later when there's questions, um, Ashok will uh, moderate that. But also Mary Louisa has some ideas on that. So with that, thank you, Mary Louisa. Welcome. Thank you very much for this. Uh, one of the kindest introductions I've ever had, Tom. And I remember very well coming and visiting you, the nerds in science, and uh, how serious you all were and bright you were. And uh, I think we delivered one of the most beautiful textile researchers, Louisa Oerste Brandt, to your, your field. So let's continue this collaboration. So I'm, I'm happy to speak uh, today about careers and research. And uh, I thought about first, Tom asked me to ask to talk about these transitions that appear will, will occur in your lives uh, too in about the middle of the career when suddenly some new priorities become important. And um, so this is uh, when you start going into leadership positions, you start taking responsibility, when you start thinking, I have no time for research anymore because I'm a leader now and I have to do all this as, as administration. And um, uh, so this is, this is, I would like to share what I have been, been doing there and thinking about, but at the same time, I know that many of you listening today are uh, maybe PhD students and postdocs, and uh, these are not your concerns right now. You think about how will I get a job? How can I manage to have small kids and uh, work from home and be the best scholar in my field? Uh, all these things. So this is what I would like to suggest. Here, the first uh, 20 minutes, I would like to talk to you about leadership transitions, uh, research traditions, uh, uh, transitions uh, in, in a long lifespan of a career. And while I do that, uh, I would suggest that all those of you who are PhD students and, uh, and postdocs, that uh, you send me a question. 
And uh, I don't want you to put in the chat because I want to offer you the opportunity to do this anonymously, but uh, you can send it uh, to my email and I put it down in the chat. And uh, if you have a question about career and what's something that you would like me to talk about. And so uh, after the first 20 minutes, I will look at your questions and take some of them up and then we can talk about them here in the round. Um, is that okay for all of you? Yeah. Um, then uh, this is, uh, I will just put, see if I can see a little bit more of you, all of you together. Good. I can see that we are many people online, so I won't be able to take all the questions, uh, but uh, just uh, some of them. I would like to start by saying that uh, it's been a really privilege to be able to do research on the field that I love the most. I fell in love with Mycenaean inscriptions. These are syllables that are used for writing before the alphabet was invented in Crete and then transmitted to mainland Greece. And it's used in palace administrations to, to record uh, transactions, taxes, uh, especially about textiles and sheep and flax and stuff like that. And uh, I saw these inscriptions when I was in my first year of university and I completely fell in love with it. And I still have this sensation when I talk, when I work with Linea B, that this is so exciting. And I feel it's a privilege to be one of the few persons in, in the world who can read this and understand it. And I find it, it's a really the love of my life in that way. And from there, I could expand to so many other fields. I could go to watch uh, Tom and Eske and uh, learn about ancient DNA proteins like Enrico and Luisa are doing. But we could also go into design, clothing, identity, terminology. There are so many things that are associated with clothing. Clothing is what we say now. It's the DNA of our culture. It is what really encapsulates, like, en encapsulates who we are and who we want to be and who we belong to, and also the, level, the technology that we combine in clothing. So I love this, and this is why we could also do a center of excellence on ancient, uh, on ancient clothing and ancient textiles. I, am, after, I, I started the center when I was 34, and uh, I had uh, 10 years of, uh, of, of research center and uh, then after the center, the 10 years funding was over, we had so many Marie Curies and other things. So we just continued. And in, a, in some way I had, re, I had achieved all the success that was possible. I thought I was you know, having a Grundforskning center and becoming professor. Uh, I couldn't really think of anything better, but at the same time, I felt extremely tired and also having this feeling that it was like the same problems kept coming back to me again. And I started doubting whether maybe, maybe, the, problem, maybe the problem was not the problems, the problem were me, that I was on, had become unable to think of ideas, you know, problems in new ways. And then this is where I bring Minik into the, into the speech because I remember very, cl very clearly that an evening in, in November, I was uh, in Minik's office with other friends and they were all having fun. And I again started talking about, ah, oh, and all this management and leadership and administration and, oh, why do I do it? And Miniki said, well, why don't you just stop? And then I, I thought immediately, he's right. Why don't I just stop? I mean, I have, I have nothing to prove anymore. I have shown everything. When we started textile research, everybody said, this is a kind of narrow research field, isn't it? And uh, 10 years after, every time I talk about textile research, they say, people say to me, but that's extremely broad. It's like everything, isn't it? And this is, I thought, okay, I've, this is what I managed to do, I, to really bring this into existence as a field. So I, I followed Minik's advice and I immediately texted to uh, the scholar who was like my, my deputy. And I said, I think it's your turn now. I, I think it's time for me to stop. Uh, and she immediately texted back, um, are you drunk? And I said, yeah, I think I'm drunk, but I still think it's true. It's, this is what I need to do. So uh, I, uh, we, we make this transition. And this is also, uh, 
I think a challenge that once you are very successful with, with something, it can be difficult to stop, even though it might not be what you really like anymore. But uh, who would like to stop being professor? Who would like to stop being the leader? But maybe it's sometimes right. And uh, especially for the young ones of you, I want to say you are going to work 50 years. So such a long time you're going to work. And maybe the, and there should be time for different different careers in a lifetime, in a work lifetime. Maybe there will be some years where you are employee, some years where you're a leader. Sometimes you work in teams, sometimes alone. But try to think of your career as, as, as a rich opportunity to do different things. And it's, uh, I also think that in research, we have some examples of people who, who, who are desperate to stay on their positions as leaders or uh, as professors and maybe uh, do not really live up to the position anymore and cannot really contribute something new. And I thought, I don't want to become a person like that. I want to, I would rather start something new. So this is why I thought, what can I do uh, new? And what I really liked was uh, to help uh, younger scholars. And I love writing applications. I love to help others find good ideas. So that's why we started UCPH Forward. At the same time, I, in this transition period, I, um, I went to INSEAD, which is a, a very prestigious management school in Paris for a course about exactly about leadership transitions and so on. And there I was working with a lot of other directors who wanted to become head of boards or um, yeah, um, managers at a, a a top level, but who wanted to go into more senior management and be more strategic. And it was very interesting to learn about that, even though our worlds are quite different, but there are some things we can learn from each other. And what, what I found most interesting is that I think that uh, we, we think of science and knowledge as something like we should just eat and eat and become wiser and better and everything. But I think for these transitions in our career, we also have to change behavior and we have to change a little bit our personality. Uh, there are some kinds of behavior that are very good to have, very, very uh, practical to have at the beginning of the career. That is when you do your PhD or your postdoc, you have to show that you are loyal, that you are independent, that you can work hard. But you have to very sh show very much that you are able on your own to do something. But the more and more that you come up in the hierarchies, I think it's important much more to show uh, the capacity to collaborate and the capacity to form alliances, uh, find good friends that you can trust and work with them across sectors, learn from others and listen more. And I find that, uh, I can only speak for myself, but I find that in, in my career, it, I have been kind of pushed a lot to be the one who speaks very much and who speaks first and who has a clear opinion about things and uh, who takes a leadership position on a lot of things. And I could see that in this transition, actually, I have to maybe downtone this a little and start listening more, being more um, considerate about uh, that. Uh, some people might don't agree. They might not agree with me, but because they want resources to be allocated in a new way, and that uh, the battles where am I right or are you right? These battles that we maybe have in science, in in leadership and strategic management, they're not so valid anymore because it's not really about who is right. It's about what what solutions can we find together. Uh, only the solutions that are good grounded actually can can work well. And uh, so I found also in myself in the in the last uh, five years that I try to to change my behavior also in order to meet these new new kinds of working together with other people. Uh, and especially in the Velux Foundation, I think uh, in the board we have a I have learned a lot about how to be on a board and uh, primarily listen, listen more than more, more than talking, and also uh, learning how much that can be gained 
from a group where we listen to each other and problems become show, seen from very many sides. And I'm just highlighting this because I find that in research, we are not often promote, not often pushed to this kind of behavior, pushed to, to know exactly by ourselves what to do and not to showing the need to listen to others all the time. Yes. So now uh, my, my new challenges have been to do, uh, to work with talent, to help others uh, find their way. That's, uh, that's, that's become uh, more interesting. And then this new position in the Royal Academy where, again, it's a very strategic work because the members of the Royal Academy are not there every day. And it's not a, it's not a leadership. I'm not the leader of the members of the Royal Academy. I mean, they're all much smarter and much more highly cited than, than I am. But it's about in the, in the strategic management, in the presidium, it is about working with the, what, what are the values for us and for science that we want to continue to communicate. And also that we want that, we want that the academy uh, shows to the outside world. And again there, I, I'm lucky to be together with a, a group. We have the board of the academy, the presidium, uh, a group of scholars that have the same uh, attitude that this is not about who's right, but it's about what can we learn from each other? And what can we learn from how science is progressing? Right now, it's very exciting that we have uh, 100 billion euros allocated to research in the EU, in the new uh, Horizon Europe. And this is going to be very, very important for all of us. And even small commas and small footnotes in the new FRAME program will be important for us. So it's important to read and know exactly uh, how how this, these, this very big investment is going to push research worldwide, not only in Europe, but globally in a new direction. So, uh, and I'm more interested in that now, but I'm still interested in linear B and textiles that will definitely continue. Yeah. I think I'm just going to see if there are some questions that have come in now. Uh. Thanks a lot, Marie Louise. That was very inspiring and nice to hear background of everything. And uh, so people, please raise your hand and uh, ask question if you want to do it in person, write in the chat, or as Marie Louise mentioned, uh, write directly to her to her email address, uh, which kind of lifts some of the burden from my end, as she'll do both the managing and uh, yeah, uh, of the questions and reading the questions. But uh, uh, anyone has any questions so far? Oh, let me just get my phone so I can read them on my phone. Too. Sure. Can Tom have a question? I've got to start. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, but we need yeah, If anyone's got questions, they don't want to be a reveal who you are, please email Mary Louisa and uh, she'll take them that way. Directly, yeah. Can you hear us again, Mary Louisa, or are you uh, not connecting to sound yet? No, it's not. Yeah, go ahead, yes. Tom. Yeah, can I ask, thank you so much, Mary Louisa. I, I have one question that I've wondered about a lot, and it fits very much with this idea you, uh, you, you, know, you had your center, you became a professor, you still are a professor, and yet you're starting to do uh, things which don't fall into the classic professor role. And, I'm curious about the view internally at KU at Saxo in your department about uh, about this transition. Is there a, is it all positive or is there even a negative view saying like, well, you're getting out of the kind of obligations we have to do as an academic or, I mean, how does that work out? I think for me personally, it was that I wanted to get out of the obligations of being a leader and manager on the day-to-day -day level uh, and I think that there were years where I did it well, but then I feel there were also, this is to be a leader can wear you, wear you out. So it's, it's tiresome in the end. And it's also the expectations that we have to our leaders. You have to be there for all the meetings, even, uh, even the meetings that you don't find interesting. You have to be enthusiastic about all people and all staff. And uh, 
there is, I think, high expectations on us both as managers and then we also as a, in a Grundforskning center, the leader also has to be the, the best scientist. So it's just a lot of pressure and I didn't mind the scientific part, but I find that, uh, that KU didn't offer the help and assistance that it was to, to be a leader of people and a leader of, leader of money and a leader of law uh, contracts. And uh, that I was left alone too much for this. And I, I didn't know how to solve it because uh, I think leadership in research has just grown and grown and grown to something that, that, it, that we, they so much expected from research leaders now that it's really difficult to do it all. I would love to hear some of the, your opinion about because many of you are also leaders of people. I know that. But I felt that it was it was hard to do, and uh, I also felt physically that, you know, starting at 34, I thought I cannot do this until I'm 70. I'm going to die. It's just too much. There's too much work. So, oops! Now the sun. I don't know what I said, but God <laughs> loves me, and suddenly I'm maybe I am dying now. I don't know, but suddenly there's so much light in here. <laughs> I'll move away. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, when you made this decision, did you feel you were supported by your head of department or your dean or whoever is relevant in the Saxo hierarchy, or was it not really even a relevant question? Well, for me, it was lovely that there was uh, Eva, who was my deputy, and who was happy to take over. So that transition was very smooth. But if you don't have uh, uh, somebody who who can take over, it will be difficult. And honestly, I have to say that in in some way, it was I think. I think my dean and head of department, they just said, well, fine. They, they, didn't, they didn't say, what, what else could you do? Or I, that was something that, that I had to invent for myself, which is a good way, because this is also show the privilege of being at university. That is that, see, I talked, I talked bad about my leaders and suddenly the sun went away again. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so we have, this is the privilege also that in many ways we can carve out our own lives and we can decide what to do. Uh, we can make these changes if we want to. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Anyway, more uh, questions? I just want to take one of the questions that is in my email. And I have one question saying uh, here, uh, Uh, let's see here. What professional advice do you have in regard to future planning for someone who wants to do all the things and not just one thing? And uh, another one, tips for an ambitious PhD student who wants to become a leader on uh, one day, but at the same time wants not to burn out in the making. Yeah, so I, the, the only advice I can offer to you is that I can say is that all of you will be in this, this situation that I was in. All of you at some moment will think, will either be forced to take up some leadership positions or you will go in by yourself. But it ill, it, so now the sun's coming again. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it is part of being, of a maturing career is that in the beginning you need to focus on yourself and then you need to take responsibility for the organization. So I think it is actually a good idea to start early thinking about what kind of leadership would you like to volunteer into? What, what would you like to do? For example, I know that uh, I, I took, a, 10 years ago, uh, I took a, a special education about board work, how to be a board member. Because I know that I thought this is some, this is a kind of responsibility. I didn't have any ambition to become a dean or a head of department, but I thought I would love to go into management where this is more the strategic level and where we are several people together who decide together. And this is board work. So I didn't know anything about being on a board and uh, I didn't know the responsibilities, the legal and the financial side. So I took a special education for that. And I think that, I don't know if that helped me, but now I'm on very many different boards and I feel very prepared for this. And I think sometimes in, in, it can be good as a kind of life planning to start putting out uh, the stepping stones in the direction that you wanna go, because then in later it might, uh, it might push you in that direction. Um, 
I think uh, it's also good to uh, to plan your careers in different uh, steps and say right now it's maybe time to focus on publications on research but when I'm in my let's say in my 40s this is where I'm going to take a break and do and serve the community by taking up leadership for studies uh, for a department for a group or something else and then be patient with yourself and accept that these years you might not publish as much but all the seeds that you put in the ground during your postdoc and your research years, they will be growing and you will, the ideas will still mature. You will never run out of ideas. So it's easy to come, come back again if you, yeah, if you, I, I think, I think many, many of us feel that it's hard to do research and leadership and management at the same time. But so if, if you can give yourself some, some time off, to do these things and accept that maybe you won't, it won't be so so productive these years. I think it's still okay because, as I said, I think a research career should should have all of this at some time. And maybe it's just a quite quite important that you think about: is it going to be when you're 60, or is it going to be when you're in your 40s, or when are you going to take up this role? Any comments on and what I said about being a leader from some of you who are leaders? Can I ask for a clarification quickly? So, yeah. are, are you still engaged in research right now, or is your non-research role so much that basically you don't have time to do that? I do more research now than I did uh, in the Grundforskning Center. Okay, that's, that's excellent. And and then um, in in that regard, um, and this is why I think you know, be careful what you, I don't know. I mean, Tom, you are you are in this position, so maybe it's different for you. But but uh, some. Sometimes I think, and I see a, a lot of talented people just wishing a, a center of excellence. I think be careful what you wish for, because uh, sometimes smaller grants can give you much more flexibility and creativity and possibility to do stuff than the big grants where there is a lot of other stuff that falls on you as a PI. Yeah, I completely agree. Completely. <laughs> um, having said that, I, I do feel the center of excellence is a perfect way to help build other people into doing research that you don't have to do yourself. So it's, a way, it's for me, it's the lazy man's way of getting uh, Anton. Uh, 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 questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Hannes has a question and then Fernando. Hannes. Uh, hi Go. everyone. Hi Marie-Louise. Thanks hi. for, thanks for um, giving us your insights. I have, I have a question. So a lot, and we come back to this, and you talked about it now. This, this, and it was also in one of your questions. The, 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 the issues surrounding mental health, and 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 we just had a little session about this this morning. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. trying to come up with uh, kind of things we could do to 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 um, you know make sure that doesn't become an issue, like among students and so on. Um, so how to be a successful researcher and not burn out and 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 do all the things we want to do. Um, now you you know you've had your center you 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 are you uh, a successful researcher you you do all the things you do um, but what would what what uh, what would you recommend uh, you know to to try and keep this this balance and not not that I want to lead you in any way but but often or sometimes one reads about that changes actually or change is a is a, is a good thing so a change in a career you know taking maybe a different direction would you would you agree with that uh, have it, you know having having done that now in, in with 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 a slightly different focus in your career that has helped you to yeah it's it's maybe um, this is also comes down to personality i think i i like very much i i'm very much a project person i like uh, i like the oops i can hardly see anything I like to I like to think and plan projects and start projects. And my patient is not so long, so I, I like to finish them again and move on to something else. This is something with age that has become more. So for me, the changes have been have given me the feeling of of controlling my own life. That I don't have to go on the it's not like a railway track that I have to. I remember when I became professor, it was a great honor and I was so happy about it. But at the same time, I thought, 
now I'm going to die. Because this is like, you can never, this is it's the best thing, but it's also now, it, now it's the end. This is, what should I do now? So this is just a personality thing, but, but um, so I liked, I liked the feeling that I could change something. And I think you all have that in some way that, that uh, there are so many things that govern us in research from outside. Uh, so funding, who is the head of department? What should I do now, my next job? And so, so it is good to, to consider, take a little time to think about what you actually can influence. I'm, I'm I think this goes for senior researchers, but also, and it's good to have a friend like Monique who just says, well, of course you can. I mean, you prestige, uh, power, positions, and so this is all. The most important thing is that you need to do something that makes you happy every day and that, that feels like a purpose. Uh, and and I also, for me, it was also to be self-critical about that maybe Maybe I'm not always the best person at doing this. That could be maybe somebody could be, be better at it uh, after some some time. Okay, I, I don't know how I got. I wanted just to come back on to because some of you on on my in my emails there are some questions about this how how to have a work life balance and also what you said, Hannes, about uh, uh, mental health. Um, for me, the, 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 the lockdown has been the best time of my life. I just love it. I love being at home and I love not having to go to work. But, uh, but I know that this is not the case for everybody. And I really think uh, we need to take quite good care of, especially the, the people who are uh, not from Denmark or just arrived here or are, are young, because it is for some people a, a very difficult time. So I, I don't think I have anything to offer for mental health right now. Mm. Uh, the other question was about a good balance between uh, private life and work life. Um, again, for me, I can only say what helps for me. I, I've been, a, I've been a, 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 for many years a single mom with a, a, a daughter who was who's perfect in all ways. So she was very easy. But for me, it helped very much, again, to think of my life in life chapters and think this is right now, it's a chapter where I need to do this. And this means that I, I can't be perfect on that and that and that. I can't write Christmas cards and I can't do that. But there will be other life chapters where I have more time. And, and uh, so it helped me not to be too critical about being, not being perfect on all the things. I don't know if that can help any of you, but... Hopefully life is long and there will be time for all the things that you find really important to do, but maybe not at the same time. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that this all sounds, sounds terribly generalizing and universal and, and uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Marilouza. Uh, Fernando <laughs> has a question, so go ahead, please, Fernando. Uh, yeah, just uh, a bit more concrete and maybe more relevant for the postdocs and the junior faculty. Uh, if you could, so I've been considering this UCPH4, but I've been constantly postponing it. And if you could give a pitch as to like uh, uh, what, like I've heard very good things about it, but like what, why should people uh, apply for this and uh, what you can get from it? Well, maybe Hannes should answer that or Christine. Or... <laughs> yeah. The... I think the idea by Jens and me, who Jens Jort, who is the other director, the idea was that we felt after having a, a Grundforsting Center, both of us, we've been friends for so many years and we've shared a lot of these dilemmas that come in the beginning of your career and later. And, and we just felt that there wasn't really a forum where we could talk about this, but we wanted to share uh, all these things, all the good things and the difficult things. And um, and see if we could, you know, prepare the next generation before they get a Grundforskning center to be aware aware of a lot of these things. Uh, so it was both this idea of kind of damage control with, for the next generation, and so we don't repeat the same mistakes all over. But then it's also this uh, really interesting thing that I feel that. Uh, I feel that we learn, of course, from our mentors and our professors. 
but we also repeat some of the same mistakes. And uh, we wanted to kind of induce some self-confidence in the next generation saying, you, have, you need, just need to find your own way. It's not, we don't have to be Minik or Marie-Louise. We can do, be completely different. We can look completely different. We can do it our own way. Uh, research centers do not have to look like each other. Uh, yeah, this is, we, we, this is what we wanted. And then uh, both Jens and I are sometimes very critical towards universities as institutions. We feel that they need to, to offer something more in society. They are like the think tanks. They are really, they have so much knowledge. And, uh, and we, we thought that with UCPH Forward, we could create a, a group of people who, uh, who stand together and have some visions and ideas about how to, how to make university better. Uh, yeah, so this, is, this was our in the idea to, that we cannot change it, but you can, because you are going to be the next heads of, heads of departments and head of studies, and you're going to have the next Grundforskning Center. So you are going to, to say, look, we don't accept that. We don't accept this tone. We, accept, we don't accept conflicts like that. We don't accept that you treat people like this. We don't accept that politicians don't take us seriously. We want to play another role in society. That's, how, that's our ambition with the participants in the UCPH role. Maybe to do all the things we didn't manage to yet in that way. Thanks. Uh, I have a question if there are no email questions uh, pending. Uh, there are, there are many email questions. Let's okay. Let me just see. Uh, uh, Okay, so do you think everyone has the quality to become a leader? I often have a feeling that managing people is much harder than doing science. Do you have any tips on how to work with people you don't like, but are critical in your organization? Maybe someone who is kind of arrogant or too smart or has some personalities that you don't like? That's a, good, that's a very good question. And another question, uh, do, you have, do you think we have an increasing responsibility to research topics related to current global challenges? Or can we feel okay about following our personal interests? Of course, these might overlap, but maybe not. But I think to the last one, to the last question, I wanna say, I think you should just stay true to what you're good at and what you love doing, because it's your life, it's your time, and uh, it's only going to be really great if you do what you really love. And then I think that with time, what you do in any case will become relevant. Maybe, it's, maybe you feel it's a little bit marginal now, but by, dig, by working really very well, it will always tap into something that is relevant in society. And you can only become relevant at that time if you have shown that you have really deep knowledge in something. So, whether it's snails or textiles or rocks somewhere, I don't know what, it will always, during your lifetime, become relevant. So that's really my, my, uh, my advice to you. I think I remember when I was doing my PhD, I was talking to a colleague from another country and I said, Ooh, but I don't know if I'm doing the right thing and my professor is not very famous and I didn't graduate from a super university in France and I haven't published as much as others and so and they, this person that I just remember telling me but you know if you do really good research it always pays off and that was a good thing to hear as a young scholar because I thought okay I'll just really do my best in what I'm good at and then try to trust that that's what counts. It doesn't count the rest so much as what I do. So I, and I really still think that's true. And it's, I think if you do well, sooner or later, you always be recognized for that. Yeah. So the other question was about to be a leader for people that you maybe don't like so much or find that they are difficult and so, yeah. Um, I think as a leader, it, uh, I think it is really difficult, but it's, it depends of course of your personality. 
I think as, as this person who wrote to me, I still think it's, it's more difficult to be a leader than to be a researcher because as a researcher, we are in our comfort zone and we do what we love. As a leader, you, you put yourself out to other people and try to help them and it's not, not the same. And also you need to take decisions over them. But we need very good leaders who are passionate and who really want to do a good job. So we, we also need to send them e emails and tell them that we love them sometimes because that's, it's really important to have people who do this job well. So do that tonight. Before you go to sleep tonight, send your email to your leaders and those that are good and tell them that you really appreciate them because I don't think they hear that so often. I think uh, with, about you know being a leader for people who are who maybe are not very compatible with yourself. I think that especially, for example, I am. A, I, I like that people are positive about what I do, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Louise Oster she can laugh about this. But you know, I'm always like, yes, let's do that, and it's going to be fantastic, and we're going to have a logo, and we're going to have a song, and it's going to be a fantastic project, and so. And I, I like staff who are like that, who say, yes, of course. And so, and, and staff members who say, wait a minute, do we have time for this? Do we have money for this? Is it, is it really relevant? And is it such a good idea? It's staff that I don't like. But I also realize that it, it, it's really important to listen to those. Uh, and this is, you know, you, you all know this, that we like who we, li who we are like. And the uh, people who have the opposite opinion are even more important maybe to listen to. So I try to, the people where I feel that I'm maybe not so sympathetic towards them, I try to put them into a category of people who have something valuable to give me because they are so different. And that can kind of help me uh, overcome uh, that I sometimes think, oh no, they talk again. And oh no, do we have to listen? And oh, the same story. And so I maybe that can can help some of you. Yeah. Any uh, yeah. do you have any uh, comments on that? Uh, no. <laughs> I'll just I have look a question, at though. Yes, come, oh, yeah. yes, please, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, could you please well, by the way, it's actually a good idea to send you direct messages. It seems that people are more uh, first active and uh, <laughs> are asking more <laughs> sensitive topics probably, but uh, yeah, mine is more detail oriented. I mean, it seems that you love current situation, both, you know, having left off, uh, you know, with a, a lot of responsibility as a leader, but also enjoying the science as you do. But so would you, for example, do it earlier without having, you know, the Kurt Fosting Center leadership? I mean, if you had the chance, would you sort of skip that phase, research directly to it, or you sort of, you know. So, sorry, needed... just because the sound was a little bit, I didn't get the start of your question. So my sound was not uh, well here. Yeah. Uh, would you would would you do it earlier without sort of doing the proper research? Would I do what earlier? Uh, switching career, basically, ah. leaving research, and uh, if you had the opportunity, and I, maybe also, uh, like, could you describe like uh, the next day, for example, when Mindy said just stop, and then you basically stopped after you know that idea. I mean, uh, what were your thoughts? Did you already plan? sort of in your back of your mind something like that or it was just a natural flow the way you basically turned up right now just like your, your, your thoughts like the flow of you know thoughts how, how did it all happen just in like more personal sort of reflection i would say i don't know i think it helped i think it helped me to stop as a direct center leader to think that there might come even better stuff after that so Sometimes, you know, the idea that maybe you need to stop doing something because something better is waiting for you. That I, it sounds maybe strange, but that was a good I, that instead of, you know, holding on to something prestigious, I could get something even better. And but that would only come if I stopped the, the first thing. I think that was what I got out of the conversation at that time. Uh, and it wasn't that I would become president of the Academy of Science. It was just that maybe my life will be much more interesting if I don't do this. Maybe I'll have get better ideas. Maybe my research will become better. So the, the, that, that, I think, was the motivation in that moment. But the other question you're asking me about whether the transition from doing research to going more into management and leadership, 
whether it would be a good idea to do it earlier. I think, honestly, I think not. I think, I think you should do it later in your career. But maybe I'm wrong because, as I said, you are the next generation and you need to carve out uh, your way of careers. And in some way, it is a pity that we need to spend 20 years doing really specialized research and then we need to do 20 years doing other things, helping the others. And maybe we could mix the careers more and have time out and do it other things. Uh, but talk with your colleagues about it. I, I can just say in my field in the humanities, it's very important to write books and papers on your own. And this is a very long process. It takes sometimes a year for me alone to write a paper. And, uh, and I can see that some of my colleagues who go too early into management seem to not have the same street credibility because they haven't produced, they haven't gone through this long, long haul of of doing research before they become leaders. So, so there is a kind of maturity and credibility that you can bring to leadership if you have a PhD and you have a scholarship and you've had grants and so. But maybe I'm just a very traditional thinking person who thinks that my leader should be somebody that I can admire that way. And I, I think, so I, I, I'm, I would open to the discussion and say maybe maybe it would be nice to have some leaders who instead just say want to, to be good leaders and, and don't have ambitions to for other things. But as a career advice right now in the system we are living in right now, I would say focus on the research as long as you can before you go over to the community tasks. Yeah. Thanks from the dinosaur here. Minik is also saying yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have one more if I can, yeah. there's nobody else asking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, could you also like describe like your professional day, how it's like? I mean, just, you know, how often do you meet as the head of the academy or yeah. like how often do you get this grant application? I mean, just like your daily life, you also do the research and supervision, like, just our, because I mean, for us, it's a bit, yeah, for most of us, it's a bit, you know, unusual and just out of curiosity, how is it? So, of course, with the COVID, everything is new now and different, yeah. but yeah. generally, I mean, my, my, my professional life is very structured in the way that two days a week, I'm a professor. One day a week, uh, I am uh, doing the talent research program. One day I do the Velux Foundation and one day I'm in the academy. That's how it's, it's in terms of my salary is organized. So I'm only professor 40% of the time. So I consider my, my research time this two days a week and the other three days I, I, I work on the different and I try to put them into these silos, very traditional, say this is my day for that, this is my mm -hmm. day for that. Because I, in my research, I, I love working in the morning in bed if possible and as long as possible and having these long long times of writing and reading and uh, not being interrupted and i feel especially now with the COVID, uh, you know we get zoom meetings all over the day and uh, it's interrupted in a way that we was already irritating before the COVID, and now it's coming back so I try to be to put out these long days or long half days where I don't have any other meetings and I can just focus on research. And this was also something that wasn't possible before. I spend a lot of time on applications, but not on my own, but reading others uh, either. Uh, in the Velux Foundation, I think we read maybe 2000 applications a year. And, uh, and then for friends and colleagues, I read uh, applications and I find that a very creative and I know that one of you in my email asked about uh, how I like to write applications and how it is to get the first grant. Um, and for me, it has helped to see application writing as a very creative process where I can start dreaming about new projects and what if and, uh, and this. So it hasn't been, a, it's never been a, a hard process uh, to write, but I think that's just attitude. I, I suggest that if you if you are there in your life where you are going to write the first applications and you feel that you are stuck, then then go and work with somebody like Enrico, 
uh, who is you know fabulous at writing but i think also has this creative side to it and how we could uh, learn from those who find application writing exciting and and so exciting that think that it's like oh is this going to be my application or is it my next paper i don't know because it's it's so full of new ideas uh, uh, maybe i got away from the questions now let me just look a little bit more for other questions did i maybe i didn't answer your your no no question. no it was perfect yes yes, yeah, yes. thanks uh, so um here is another question did you have any difficulties keeping in touch with your team during lockdown how did you find the right motivation and how did you motivate your team do you have any tips for pis and students uh, and uh, i think that it's a uh, i can only say my uh, with the teams that i work with since many years it's been no problem it's just been a new way of talking and really cozy the, the great challenge is to start new projects right now i think i have a uh, I've just uh, last year I got a cost action and we are 31 countries and uh, 250 participants and this is just whew. okay it would be difficult to meet all together anyway but uh, but uh, I feel that that uh, with new projects uh, you need to double up on meetings you need to need to double up on information and uh, also need need to to really not just put a uh, information but also adds this this the whole social side that you can give with your language and your voice and your body language to make people feel welcome it needs to be stronger uh, i just heard recently also that uh, we tend to we tend we communicate so much with our body in our collaborations that uh, that uh, we don't consider that now that I'm looking at you, I'm really making an effort to smile more and use my hands. And so, because, uh, because they, there is a dimension of me that, that you don't get if I don't do it. So I think uh, very clearly, so think about on your Zoom meetings to be more smiling and more explicit with your face, uh, especially maybe with students or people who don't know you, uh, because you might look your, your, your listening face might be like this, so they think you're angry because they can't see that also that you are, yeah, they can't hear, hear. I think you got my point. So more meetings, more, more kind of social interaction. It doesn't have to be a Friday bar online, but just something that shows a little bit more than, than, than naked information that gives people a feeling of being part of a community. I'm just looking for another question. It's very well, many nice questions you sent me. Thank you so much. Uh, Morten has a question. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, Morten, please. Yeah. Hi, Marie-Louise. Hi. Uh, first, yeah, thanks so much for giving us such a deep piece of yourself. Much mm. appreciated. I was just having one quick. So during your daily needs for for getting inspiration for dealing with management issues, both small and large, what has been your main sources of inspiration? So has it been your like horizontal peers, your own leaders or like social network contacts that have been more distant from the actual work? Or where have you normally seek advice on just dealing with management issues? Or personal yeah so i have been uh, that thank you for this great question morton and this is will bring me uh, directly to something that i actually wanted to say from the start but i have forgotten i think it's very important to form these um, these informal networks but still a little bit formalized of of people you trust i was very lucky when i got uh, my center of excellence with four other directors at the first boot camp and the, you know, then we were a little bit told we are all in competition because we are all the brightest. And, and then uh, with four others, we thought, okay, but why should, why don't we just be the best friends forever? And we will not be in competition because we are, we are anyway very different. And if they want to fund textile research and not astrophysics, that's their choice, but we can't help that. So, so with these uh, centers of excellence leaders, I have been a, uh, I've been meeting with them every three months for 15 years now, and we've never missed out a meeting. And this is where I can 
all the things that I can, the, the concerns that I have, the doubts, the, this is where I could, where I could, then I could share with. Uh, I also have some, some other gatherings of, P, of, of, of professors where I meet sometimes. And I think it's a good, especially when you are about to start a project or you are going into a position where you take responsibility for others, set up a support system for yourself, set up a structure. Uh, it's good to have a coach, of course, but set up a, a round of people that you trust and that you meet on a regular basis. And I would suggest maybe not your best friends, because if you meet just with your friends, maybe they do something else. And of course, it's nice to talk with them, but see if you can find people who are a little bit in the same position where you can, there is a give and take of, uh, of this and take it seriously. Maybe, maybe it's not so interesting the first times you meet but then over the years, it is very valuable. And it's, it's actually good to have some professional groups like that, where maybe, maybe you don't know each other's kids and husbands and all this, but it's just, a, it's just for work. But you take this time to talk about in a trustful area, what is, what is my big problem? What is, uh, what is going well? What is not going well? And uh, I think this is a kind of investment that you need, you could do now already that will pay out the rest of your life that you have people who you can turn to uh, and that who, who can turn to you when they have and it can also be for example yeah already as a phd student to have some some people but it's best that they're not too close to your field uh, because it's nice to have people who look a little bit outside that this is really um, it's been a, a great gift for me to have that Thank you. Thanks a lot, Uh I'm not sure we have any more time for more questions unless there is a super short one over the email or something. Yeah, let me but, just uh, see. Yes. Uh, sure. Yeah, because I'm not sure we want to keep taking you any more of your time. So. Yes. It's, uh, okay, I will. The obvious question is, what is today in your schedule? Is today a research day or a villain day? <laughs> the rest of the day is just research. <laughs> and tomorrow is my birthday, so I'm going Ooh. to plan, a, plan, plan cooking. And uh, I am, uh, I'm writing a paper about sheep in antiquity. So I'm very happy. This is just what I love, love doing. I'm, I'm an expert on sheep now. <laughs> It's been lovely talking with you all. And uh, I mean, I know from Enrico and uh, Thais and everyone, I know you're all really, really bright and, and you're, a good, you're good to each other. So uh, I hope everything will be fine. Lovely to see you, Sandra, also. Can't see all of you, so.